Our next speaker is Dr. Julie Riggs, who is the Senior Head of Education at the British Safety Council. Very trusted peer of mine, and I'm absolutely delighted to be introducing Julie for you this afternoon. Julie has over 30 years experience as a health and safety practitioner, trainer, and uh, oper operates in a wide variety of different roles in terms of strategic, corporate, and global roles. Julie has broad cross-industry experience. She has a doctorate in her field and has a chartered fellowship with the IOSH as well. She's an established writer and published author, and Julie has also contributed to commercial and government research projects. We recognize the negative impact on our health from an external air pollution piece, but there's such a bigger, much more invisible threat from our indoor working environments that can be 20 times more polluting than outdoor air. So Julie is going to break this down for us, help us examine the impact of air quality on our cognitive functions, our mental health, our productivity and our well-being. Julie will also explore some of the legislations that hide the components of chemicals we spray into the air and the low levels of testings and standards that it does currently exist. Julie has extensive experience with indoor air quality and she's written the IAQ index as well. She's widely published. Julie, over to you and welcome from our side. Thank you very much, Stephen. That's such a lovely, warm welcome, and it's fantastic to be here as part of this whole conversation about how we really integrate well-being within our, our community. So thank you. So uh, welcome very much to everyone on this session on indoor air quality and the impact on cognitive function, productivity, and well-being. We're going to start with just a very simple quiz if you'd like to participate. It's completely anonymous. If you grab your phones, you'll see a little QR scanner. If you line up the code on your screen and it will take you to a link for some very simple questions that we're going to ask you about indoor air quality. So in this session, we're going to be understanding a little bit more about how it enters through our noses and it travels around our body. We're going to understand a few key terms in indoor air quality or IAQ. We're going to review some of the impact it has on the cognitive function of the brain. And we're going to use some examples in there. We're particularly going to have a look at carbon dioxide, so the air that you breathe out, and also scent, perfumes. And finally, we're going to discuss some emerging issues around brain health as well. You will also see at the bottom of some of these slides um, some questions. So please feel free to use the commentary box as well to engage in the session as we go through. OK, so uh, let's, get, let's get started. And we're going to, first of all, start by understanding a little bit more about the unconscious action that you take every day, and that's breathing. So we take it for granted, yet it's just such a vital function of our body and our brains. Every breath supplies our, our blood with oxygen, and it also removes metabolic waste in the form of carbon dioxide, so the air that you breathe out. You take approximately 20,000 breaths a day, so if you want to visualize that volume, if you replace the content of a five gallon water bottle that sits on top of a water cooler, if you substitute that water with air, you'll breathe equivalent of 600 bottles every single day. Now that air consists of oxygen, nitrogen, and the remaining is small amounts of argon, carbon dioxide, other different types of gases and water vapor. And it's that 1% that we're most interested in because it holds dust, chemical components, biological agents. Now, the impact from all of these different variables can affect our health both physiologically and also psychologically. They can affect our perception on our environment and they can determine whether our surroundings are conducive and comfortable to us. Air quality is a very broad subject. So in this session, we're just gonna focus briefly on the impact to our brains and we're going to understand a little bit more about how air quality is integrated into a lot of well-being programs. So we're going to start by looking at the definition of indoor air quality, IAQ. And what you'll note by looking at the definition on the screen is it's not just linked to physical conditions. So often we associate poor air quality with lung and respiratory conditions, but it's also linked to psychological, which is what we're going to be talking about today. But there is a stronger case for businesses to invest in this area due to the strong impact on productivity and performance. And so we're going to look at some of the research around productivity 
Uh, it's a huge area again, but we're going to look at one or two examples today and why if you're a chess player or a stock investor, air quality might actually be quite critical to you. Air quality is complex, of course, and the quality of the air is very important, but so is the perception of air quality as well. So air quality doesn't necessarily have to be bad, but if you perceive the quality of the air is poor, such as there's an odour you don't like in the, in the environment, or maybe it's too hot for you, you can still get associated short-term symptoms from it as well, just from your perception of it. So here we go, first quick pop question that I've put in the bottom of the slides here. And this is all regarding your perception and control of your environment. So please use the commentary box to, to give some of your answers. Temperature in the workplace can be a cause of discomfort for occupants. So what percentage of facility managers do you think has installed a fake thermostat in the workplace? We'll come back and talk about that answer in a second. So I put a couple of bullet points uh, on the screen, which is all related to the public health crisis that we are experiencing at the moment. It's often unspoken about or considered. Um, I often, when I talk about indoor air quality, I refer to it as the sleeping giant of the future. And if you look at some of those bullet points, you can see that it's nearing a public health crisis. It's considered one of the top health hazards in the world. And we know at least 50% of all illnesses are considered to be caused or aggravated by indoor air quality. And the cost to our society, the NHS industry, is enormous. So if you just take asthma as an example, we have some of the highest asthma rates in the world. The NHS spend around about one billion pounds treating asthma cases every single year. But we need to be looking upstream as to the causes of it. And of course, there are a variety of reasons, including genetics, but they're huge contributing factors from our environment. Now, you heard Stephen say earlier on that we know that at least our indoor environment is conservatively at least 20 times more polluted. In some research, we almost say up to 200 times more, re, uh, more polluted as well. So it, it's quite varied. Um, it's much more pollutant than outdoor air. We have unknown levels of chemical components that are in it that are related to cancer, birth defects, um, there's also a lot around fair ever chemicals that are in, in our blood system as well, which I'll talk a little bit more about as we go through. But the key message about all of this is like a lot of considerable amount of health issues. This is preventable. And we need to start raising the agenda and start educating the world on the long term health hazards. Most of the toxins in the air that we're breathing in are quite low level, but they shouldn't be dis disregarded as harmless. So we can have an accumulative effect within the body and we must consider that. So there's no doubt that the extent of contamination in the air we breathe is serious. But also, like many other health topics, it's sometimes a latent reaction to years of low level exposure causing health complications. So sometimes it's difficult to make that direct correlation between the two. So let's go back to that uh, perception. And I, I mentioned about facility managers installing fake thermostats so that the occupants have a perception that they have control over their environment. Well, we know that 73% of facility managers in 2003 actually did this. So it creates a greater le level of satisfaction for occupants. There's less complaints, less ill health symptoms associated with it as well. So whenever we look at air quality, the perception of how people perceive it is, is important. So we'll talk a little bit about outdoor air just for a moment as well. And you may be aware of, of the British Safety Council's campaign on time to breathe. And this is an important factor of indoor air quality. There have been a number of studies looking at the impact of outdoor air on occupants. And many have focused on traffic fumes. So that's the ultra fine particles, black carbon and nitrogen dioxide, which I'll talk about in a minute. And, and we've all become very aware of the tragic case of Ella's death in February 2013, caused by acute respiratory failure, severe asthma, and of course that linkage, a very important linkage with air pollution exposure. We know that that combined effect of ambient air pollution and household air pollution is associated with 7 million pre, uh, premature deaths annually. There's a lot of research in this area as well. As an example, pregnant women who live within 50 meters of a major road exposed to traffic fumes can increase the odds of miscarriage by 50%. So levels of outdoor pollution, they vary according to the climate and, and the weather that's out there. So outdoor pollutants 
up in a lower atmosphere due to temperature inversion. So basically cold air traps pollution under a warm current. So it keeps it at that low level. And of course, when we get, we get certain times of the day, like um, let's say heavy rush hour traffic, we have a higher level of buildup. And of course, once that starts to subside, things like wind and change in temperature can alter that. However, when we look indoors, those pollutants become trapped in that space. They don't have the same level of dispersion that you do outside. And the only way to deal with that is opening a window or using some type of air cleaning device. Occupants don't have the same level of control over these pollutants. So, and as we see, more and more people are working from home now. So many people don't have the benefits of an office ventilation system with filters in. So the likelihood is they're actually being exposed to more pollutants from indoor air. And of course, increased heating costs. It's, it's predictable that less people are gonna open windows to get fresh air in because they want to keep that heat inside of their building. So we are seeing an increase of indoor pollutants. Our noses, they're the gatekeepers to our lungs. So when you have distinct odors, they all carry molecules and they trigger that sense, that receptor in our, in, in our brains. And it's connected to the emotion of an odor as well. So scientists will estimate that we remember as little as 5% of what we see, but as much as 30% of what we smell. And, and this is because our sense of smell is the most closely connected with our hippocampus in our brain. And that's the part of the brain which stores memories. Also, our brain performs less of a filter to reach this space. So use your commentary box again. What is your favorite and least favorite sense? And, and what memories do they actually stimulate from that? So our bodies are actually very efficient at removing some pollutants. So we'll sneeze or we'll cough them out. And we have tiny little um, mucus hair, sorry, cilia hairs and mucus in our nose and our throat. We also have uh, microphalanges that are found in our liver and our spleen and our connective tissue. So if you think of them a bit like a Pac-Man roaming around your body and they destroy microbes and invaders inside of our body. And these are natural defenses that have been built up from our own evolution. But now consider how the environment has changed, particularly since the industrial revolution. Our bodies are not adapted to the chemicals and particulates that we breathe in. So a very simple example. If you think about cutting wood by hand with a handsaw and think about the size of particles, then compare that with maybe using a bandsaw or a jigsaw, the particles are much smaller and our bodies aren't able to defend themselves against that size of particles. So in this slide, you'll see I've provided some examples of indoor pollutants, which can generate from mold and VOCs from furnishings. So that, that new smell, sometimes you can smell when you open a magazine or you've got some shoes, you get that sort of uh, solvent smell of it. You can get chemical fumes from products, paints, combustion gases, um, radon in some areas of the country, dust mites, animal hair, dander. So aside from indoor pollutants, again, think about we've got that external air that also becomes concentrated indoors and it adds to this huge toxic soup that we're all breathing in. With hundreds of different variable components, um, typically health effects can include eyes, nose, throat, irritation, headaches, migraines, nausea, fatigue, feeling of dizziness. And of course, your reaction to indoor air pollutants, it can be very individual. So that can, people can have different effects from gender, age, activity within the exposed area, your sensitivity to certain chemicals, repeated exposures, uh, pre-existing conditions can all have an impact. Some health effects actually take many years after the exposure to actually display themselves. And so some of these health effects can be respiratory disease, heart disorders, cancer, and some very debilitating or fatality types of conditions. Mental health conditions, reduction in productivity, um, and comfort are all linked to polluted air. A frightening fact for you, for those that are safety practitioners amongst us, if you look at your COSH data sheet and you look at that CAS number, the Chemical Abstract Service number, that's the global listing of chemicals that's based in the, UK, in the US, and they actually add 33,000 new chemicals every single day to that database. So often these chemicals are tested in silo, and we have no idea about the combined effects of these chemicals. So it's definitely a growing and huge problem. So um, 
Another question for you, have you experienced a reaction to the air? Do you get headaches from perfume? Do you get eye nose irritation from cleaning products? Let us know. So before we progress a little bit further, um, I just want to understand a few terms with you as well, because you'll hear me and other people who discuss air quality talking about different measurements. So we'll just take a moment to understand what they are and why it's important. When we look at concentrations of pollution in air, we typically measure them in units of mass. So we talk about milligrams as an example, and we do it by volume of air, so such as cubic meters. So in general terms, if the measurement is a solid, like a fume or a, or a dust, we'll use milligrams per cubic meter, although asbestos is actually expressed as fibers per milliliter of air. But if it's a vapor or gas, we use parts per million. And to gain an insight into how we visualize this amount, what does that mean in, in reality term? You can see on the left-hand side, if you, take a, uh, if you take milligrams per cubic meter, if you take a football pitch and you fill it to one meter high of dust and you take a teaspoon of that, that is the one milligram per cubic meter, so the volume of it. So you, we're talking very, very small amounts here. It, when we start talking about pots per million, um, if you consider 50 three-bedroom houses and you fill them full of party balloons, it's the equivalent of one party balloon in all of those houses. That's one parts per million. So it just gives you a little bit of insight. So when we're talking about some of these differences, it's small amounts. Uh, the other term that I just want uh, to explain to you as well, which you'll hear a lot when we talk about air quality, is the size of particulates. And so we measure these in microns, sometimes also known as micrometers, but microns is most popular what we talk about. And one micron is a millionth of a meter. That gives you an idea. So here's some examples on here. So if you take your hair, a strand of your hair, it's typically between 50 to 70 microns in diameter. If you look at dust in a, in a shaft of life, so you know sometimes you can't see it, but you, you have a, a sunlight pouring through your window and you can see the dust moving around. The smallest size of dust you're going to see there is about 25 microns. Anything below that generally is invisible to the human eye to be able to look at. So many of the particles are too small for us to see, and so we may not necessarily know we're being exposed to things. So remember when I talked about cutting wood, well, wood dust can be anything between 10 to 30 microns, but if we process it using jigsaw, it can be as small as five microns. So some of it's too small for us to see. So understanding why that's important, if you look at this graph, you'll see on the left-hand side, this is the smallest type of particulates that are invisible to the human eye. And then as you go more to the right hand side, this is what you can actually see. So if you look at it, you can see we've got beach sand. Well, yes, I can see beach sand. Um, but you also know that you can't see bacteria with the human eye. But if you look at some of those other particulates like flour dust and cement dust, you can see some of the large particles, but not the finer, smaller sizes. And the reason why size is important is it's the impact the particulate will have on the body. So larger particulates we can remove by those natural defenses. So remember the cilia hairs, the mucus, the Pac-Mans that are roaming around. But and 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 microfans just for the just for the um, just for the commentary on it, they're around about 21 microns in size. And so they can destroy things, but they can't destroy everything in all parts of our body. So when it becomes really small particulates, our body cannot defend ourselves against it. So this is why it's so important when we talk about size and why we're doing this. The smaller the particulate, the further it can travel. So if we look at mid-range particles, PM10, so that's 10 microns or less in diameter, they're likely to become lo lo uh, lodged in our upper respiratory tracts. That's in your nose and your throat. So think about pollen and, and pet dander, mold spores, um, small dust particles. Generally, we can, we can cough or, or sneeze them out. And they are known to trigger asthmatic episodes and allergic attacks from that point. Fine particles, 2.5 or less, bacteria, mold, again, some pollen, tobacco smoke, uh, burning candles as well, uh, all quite invisible. And they travel to the lower parts of the respiratory tract. So you can see they're starting to invade a little bit the upper part of our lungs. Very fine, fine particles. So this is one micron or less. Uh, this is from things like um, viruses, exhaust gas, and they get into the recesses of our lungs. And then it's the ultra fine particles. This is the bit we're gonna talk a little bit about today. So this is 0.1 microns or less in diameter. So think about tra traffic fumes, fires, and some of the chemicals, metals that we're gonna talk about, they can travel around our body. 
these smaller particles can travel to our, our liver, our spleen, our bone marrow, our reproduction system, kidneys, and our central nervous system leading to the brain. So have a think a moment. How long do you think that the air that you breathe in, how quickly is it going to affect your brain? How many seconds or minutes do you think that's going to take? And I'll tell you the answer in a second. So how does something that you breathe in go to your brain? Well, as we breathe air into our lungs, there is a gas exchange that occurs and, and it's between our blood and the air. So your, your lungs contain five lobes filled with small spongy sacs, sacs called alveoli. And those walls are extremely thin. They're about 0.2 micrometers, and they're covered in tiny blood vessels, which you can see on here, called pulmonary capillaries. So as we breathe in, oxygen diffuses into those red blood cells, and it also releases back carbon dioxide, which we ex exhale. So that's usually about four or five percent. That oxygen then travels to the heart and then is pumped around the rest of, the, of our body. But it's not just oxygen that diffuses into our blood. Because many of the particulates of pollution are so small, they can travel along that gas exchange. So they accompany the oxygen and, and, and they travel around our body with blood being the vehicle. So they can also cross into our blood um, brain vessels as well. So they can cross um, via the blood vessels into our brain and they can cause inflammation in our brain tissue. So did you answer correctly? It actually takes four seconds for the air to, for you to breathe in, for it to impact your brain. So it's pretty quick. So we've learned why air quality is important and how it travels to the brain. And I mentioned earlier that there's lots of many factors regarding this recipient, including the age. So air pollution impact starts before we're even born. And we have found black carbon particles. So think about traffic fumes and also um, wood burning stoves, things like that. We found those black carbon particles have been found in the lungs and brains of fetuses. So children are much more vulnerable um, to exposure just purely because they've got developing organs, their immune system, their neurological system is still evolving at that time. 90% of brain development happens by the age of four. And because children have lower body weight, children breathe in a relatively greater volume of air than adults, and thus it results in a, in a greater body burden. And what I mean by body burden is the amount of a particular chemical stored in your body at any particular time that your body struggles to remove. So as adults, we have about 700 contaminants inside of us that our body has not evolved enough to be able to remove it. There are numerous studies linking the relationship between babies and children and exposure to fine particulate matter. Um, it's linked to poor behavioral functions, lower IQ, lower memory, cognitive performance uh, weaknesses. Uh, we've also seen it's linked to children who experience attention problems, anxiety and depression symptoms as well. So again, commentary box, have a think. Consider what the actions are as a new parent, when you bring a newborn baby home, what have you done? You've probably brought in new furniture, new furnishings, plastic matting. You may have decorated and painted the space. You've probably closed the window and heated the room. And if you imagine that's what you're doing to a, a new baby with developing lungs, the impact that it's going to have. But it's not just children. We've seen increasing amount of events are emerging that shows airborne pollution is associated with increased risk of um, dementia, uh, Alzheimer's disease, um, and, and generally uh, a decline in cognitive ability in adults. Um, interestingly, if you look at Parkinson's disease, uh, uh, research has just come out today, uh, we know that it, it's doubled in the last 30 years, and we know that there's a very strong connection with air pollution. Researchers in Canada um, looked at 6.6 .6 million people using postcodes to measure how close they live to major roads and the medical records to identify residents who've gone on to develop early dementia. So it's, it's a very interesting subject. And as we said, there's, there's lots of causes in there, but we do recognize there is some type of relationship between it. The Lancet in 2020 listed air pollution as one of the 12 most modifiable risk factors for dementia. Of course, like many contributing factors um, that can influence dementia, um, it, you know, you can have health conditions and, and age as well and genetics that are associated with it. And so it's very difficult and complicated um, to talk about air pollution around it because we know that it's latent effects. 
difficult to conclusively say that that was a contributing cause or a major contributing cause. So research have been looking at oxidizing stress, which is the imbalance of toxic molecules inside of our cells and also the antioxidants that are needed to remove them. And this has been connected to the onset of dementia. So we're able to single that out and understand that now. Air pollution can cause restricted blood flow in arteries. It can lead to higher blood pressure and increased risk of strokes. And those are both factors associated with dementia. We also know higher rates of psychiatry illnesses such as depression, schizophrenia, bipolar, personality disorders have all been linked to um, polluted air. Uh, lack of oxygen. Uh, some substances can give you an asphyxiation or it can reduce oxygen that can affect brain tissue as well. And of course, we know heavy metals, organic solvents are associated with um, depression, mood disorders, motor functional um, uh, issues and mental slowing of memory and concentration. Um, and I'm sure you may know the story about Alice in Wonderland. Well, we know Lewis Carroll in 1865 used to live near the hat factories and probably have, has witnessed the impact of mercury on the central nervous system of workers who are curing felt onto top hats. Hence, we believe that was the inspiration for the Mad Hatter character. Um, but let's look at some simple examples. And I said we'd talk about a couple of examples here. So first of all, we'll look at carbon dioxide, which is the air that you breathe out. Um, and typically, uh, indoor concentrations are around about 380 to 250,000 parts per million. The workplace exposure limit is EH40 connected with COSH, so you shouldn't be exposed to more than 5,000 parts per million over an hour period, and that's to protect unwanted changes uh, and pH levels in your body. Although carbon dioxide, we know you may not exceed 5,000, but we certainly know it's very typical to exceed 1,000 parts per million that you probably wouldn't even notice in your environment. So we do know that it has cognitive effects. Um, as soon as you start going over 800 parts per million, we know that people get health effects, um, headaches, fatigue, eye symptoms. You can see I'm talking about migraine sufferers will suffer with symptoms from it. We know that it can increase anxiety and increase sensitivity to anxiety sufferers as well. Um, interestingly, uh, I did a study about 16 years ago where we looked at slight elevations of carbon dioxide, so around 1,000 parts per million. And we saw that uh, students performing uh, tasks, cognitive tasks, we actually saw a reduction in their cognitive ability, so the reaction decision making. This study has been repeated many, many times before, and actually we have very similar results that come from it as well. So you, you think when you're sitting in a, a stuffy meeting room, feeling tired, how does that affect your performance? So carbon dioxide, it's, it's a very simple, inexpensive to measure and generally we treat this as a basic measurement so it tells us if, if we haven't got enough air exchange in a room it's likely that you'll have buildup of other contaminants in it so even though it seems something simple and we actually contribute towards it it can actually be quite a significant factor and um, as I said we don't often associate air quality with poor performance um, but however you consider that 30 percent reduction think how critical that could be if you're an airline pilot or if you need to make a strategic decision, or if you're a chess player. So with a prize money of 1.6 billion million uh, US dollars, uh, the Champion Chess Tour, um, the researchers actually did um, uh, some uh, research on looking at the quality of strategic decisions against air quality. So they took some air quality readings, they were looking at carbon dioxide, par particulate matter and temperature um, inside tournament rooms and looked at 30,000 different moves by chess players, 121 of them. And it looked at three tournaments that played out in Germany over two months in 2007, 18 and 19. And they compared the optimum types of chess moves against a chess computer. And if and with even slight increase in air pollution, the likelihood that the players would make a mistake increased by 2.1%. Severity of those errors rose by 11%. And we've also looked at studies comparing very, very similar sort of data, looking at the New York Stock Exchange and also 100,000 investors in a German, German brokerage firm as well. And again, when we looked again against the particulate pollution, uh, we analysed the decision of investment. We can see just even with it one standard deviation, uh, we were seeing a 12% reduction in same day returns. So again, just thinking about those critical decisions you make, it seems low level, but actually could be quite critical to someone's well-being or, or their cognitive function or their productivity within a business. 
Um, I want to talk a little bit about perfumes as well. So this is a really interesting one. It affects a lot of us. And uh, you might want to comment about how often you wear scent or whether you use scented candles uh, in and around your workspace or home. Scented candles, scented marketing, scented products are on the increase. You only need to look at the supermarket shelves of air fresheners to see a growing industry there. Scent is more closely linked to our memory uh, than any other scent, and they can stimulate lots of uh, emotions for us. However, 95% of all chemicals that are in fragrances today are synthetic, and they derive from things like petroleum, benzene, um, other toxins and sensitizers in there, and they're capable of causing allergic reactions, asthma, respiratory disorders, and so forth. 84% of all of these ingredients have never been tested for human toxicity, and those that have been tested have only been tested minimal. So many of these chemicals um, we, we recognize also can have effect on the central nervous system. Studies have shown that fragrances can cause circuitorial changes and electricity activity in the brain, and these changes can include trigger and migraine, headaches, affect the ability to concentrate, dizziness, and fatigue. Um, researchers also suggest that products can contribute towards ADHD as well. If you think about aluminium in aerosol form, that's very readily absorbed into the brain through the nasal passage. And studies have shown that regular use of this product, in particular deodorants, uh, can increase the, the risk of Alzheimer's by as much as, as, as three times. So aside from wellbeing comfort perspective, 15 to 30 percent of the general population report some type of sensitivity to chemicals which include fragrances and that can be very difficult to avoid in a public or workspace. Um, so I've put a little bit of a, um, a, a research paper on here as well for you to have a little look at and just, just cited it um, which is a, a recent one that's been published but just talking about fragrances itself in 2004 um, there were a research paper that concluded that Mothers who use air fresheners on a daily basis almost suffer 10% more headaches than those that use it less than once a week. And of those mothers who use air fresheners, we found 16% suffer from depression compared to those mothers that didn't. And of course, again, there's many other factors associated with it, but it's interesting to delve a little bit deeper into that research. So we know that we've got chemicals like formaldehyde and tooling, um, all sort of different types of chemicals that we know cause cancer, birth defects, hormone disruptors, infertility, um, and all of these are legally allowed in products. Some of these chemicals can store in our blood and fatty tissue, and they can remain there forever. Um, and they, they're very persistent. And those uh, forever chemicals that we talk about are very persistent, and we find them in scent as well. Interesting about fragrances, the formulas are considered trade secret. So we don't have to tell you the actual ingredients uh, in a label onto fragrance. We simply just need to say that it has fragrance in there. Fragrance free or unscented doesn't actually mean that there's no fragrance in there either. It just means you don't have a perceivable odor that comes off it. So if you think about lots of other consumer products like food, drug, cosmetics, we need to list all the ingredients on the label. So we have this strange loophole for scent that we don't need to tell you what's in there. So this particular study that I put on here, you can see from the information on there that actually um, the amount of exposure that we all have is huge. And there are some individuals that are much more susceptible to it. And, and we would expect us, people that have uh, symptoms of asthmatics. But also uh, we can see that there are vulnerable uh, individuals um, that, um, uh, who may be associated with autistic types of symptoms as well. And we can see number of work days are quite large there. So scent is quite big business and it's now been used to influence in the decision making on product goods. And um, there's, a, there's a, a story about how scent marketing came and I'll just indulge you for a few seconds on this with a short story. But marketing of products uh, really came around in the 1990s thanks to Rolls-Royce. So Rolls-Royce used to have these wonderful kind of silver clile cars in the 1950s and 60s. It was the epitome of luxury with walnut kind of um, walnut wood for doors and, and, and dashboards and wall carpet and all that sort of thing. However, by the mid 1990s, customers were complaining it didn't feel luxurious anymore. So Rolls-Royce went and evaluated one of their uh, silver cloud car. Uh, it's the 1965 model one for those that are interested. And one of the, the uh, researchers that they did is looked at the smell of the car as well. And they found there were 800 different types of scent. So things from leather, mahogany, walnut, under seal, oil, felt. And 
they realized that this was quite an important factor of the experience that people were getting buying their car. So they actually produced a synthetic version of this and they infused it into the, their modern cars. So no longer can we have walnuts anymore because we need to replace it with plastics and bonds and other types of safety devices. So they bottled it, uh, they actually infused it into those uh, synthetic materials. And now we have that alluring scent of luxury and it's a familiar tactic now if you buy most cars or you get your car validated you'll, you'll smell that new car smell so rolls royce inver invariably had been the innovators behind brand and scent marketing and um, scent trade marketing continues and you'll see lots of brands have recognized traded types of, of smells disney being one and we've seen japanese phone companies have created new tech smells and are built into phones and uh, we're seeing electronic sensing or e-sensing digital smells as well and we're also putting scent capsules into water bottles to give us the illusion of a flavour as well. And all of these elements are being built into our air, to that toxic suit that I talk about. And we have no idea about the impact that these are going to have. In fact, innovation is quicker than the researchers uh, to be able to keep up with it. So measuring IAQ is complicated. Um, you know, it's unlike a noise where you, you take a noise sample, one bit of kit with air quality. There's lots of different types of kit that you need, whether you're measuring gases or VOCs or dust or moles. So there is a reluctance in the uptake of, of measuring uh, air quality. It is an invisible hazard. And when we discuss it, we often uh, think about physical, but we've got to start thinking about the broader impact that it has. And, and also to understand that there's a huge emotional, economic and moral reasoning behind it. 99% of the global population, including the UK, breathe unclean air that does not meet the World Health Organization guidelines. And in urban areas, we're beginning to see health inequality is forming as well. So individuals are taking approach to it and they're engaging much more in the indoor air quality debates through policies and adopting well-being programs. Uh, this particular example you can see on the screen is uh, the owners of April, Apricot Tree Cafe in Ontario in Canada who now have QR codes on their buildings so you can check the air quality before you enter into it. So there are lots of practical things that we can do to improve the environment within well-being and health in, in the home or workplace. And we often focus on the management of somebody's health. But what we need to do is look further upstream and understand the causes. And sometimes they're not as obvious, but and they can be complicated. But the first step is engaging in the conversation, being transparent. So there's a couple of top takeaways that I want you to take away from the session today. And that is IQ is complicated, but it doesn't have to be expensive. And it's about controlling sources, ventilating buildings. We need to understand the well-being of your building envelope, monitoring it talking to building facility management. And we need to adopt IAQ into our wellbeing programs, educating, air testing, controlling source pollution, monitoring, and also having a process for reporting, investigating issues. And finally, my, my final slide really is talking about the lungs of a building have to be well. IAQ is increasingly embedded into corporate wellbeing programs, and we're delivering a healthier, happier work environment for people. If you expect the food you eat and the water you drink to be uncontaminated, you should expect the air we breathe also to be safe. So as a society, we need to be engaged a lot more in the conversations around air quality. We need to take it much more seriously, more research is needed. We need to be able to um, uh, adopt uh, research into, uh, into government businesses and individuals and demand global standards for indoor air quality. We need to reduce those emissions exposure. We have a fundamental right to breathe clean air. The risk from indoor air pollution affects everyone, but unlike many other health initiatives where you can make a choice about your own actions and your behaviours and that impact on your health, indoor air quality requires us all to come together as a collective community to champion the change on improving the air that we breathe. So please do take a look at our Time to Breathe campaign on our website and be part of the conversation, be part of raising the agenda that will make a difference to all of our lives here. And that starts with you creating a legacy, your actions, your contribution to change. Thank you very much for your time today. Um, I do hope I've stimulated some further thoughts and dialogue in your workplace about indoor air quality uh, and looking after your health and well-being of your colleagues. Thank you. Stephen. Julie, thank you ever so much. That, that, I think I've just learned so so much about the importance of indoor air quality and of course the impact of uh, air quality as a whole 
lots of questions came through. I've, I've popped some of those over for you now, but I, I, like, I'll go through them one by one. Obviously, we're, we're conscious of time. Everything we don't get to, we can, we can cover off at the end. Uh, but to the first one, um, great question. Any obvious, what, what kind of equipment would you be recommending mm. in terms of indoor monitoring of air quality within offices? The first thing I would say to you is carbon dioxide read air. They're very inexpensive, they're very cheap, and if you can take a reading of that, if you have high levels of carbon dioxide, it's likely you'll have higher other types of contaminants in your in your air. So it's a very cheap and expensive way of taking a very simple reading. And actually, you may even be able to get it if you've got um, if you've got sort of mechanical ventilation systems in your building, you may actually just be able to get a reading from that from your facility managers. When you take the reading, take it at its worst case scenario. So when you've got the most population in at the end of the day, so that we can see the buildup of carbon dioxide. No point taking a reading at five past nine in the morning when people have just arrived. So uh, carbon dioxide is the first one I would say to, to actually have a look at. Thank you. Uh, I love this second question. It's, it's quite a very broad generic question. I guess it's, 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 it's there to kind of get our initial, your initial reaction thoughts to it. How much of this impact on indoor air quality relates to the immediacy by you and I in our day-to-day -day jobs in our home offices or in the office and the impact those factors have on how we perform and how much of it is about the long-term deterioration through ongoing exposure. Yeah, so health is always very difficult to make a direct linear relationship with that air pollution has caused this and we've seen that with the recent air pollution case of traffic pollution. Uh, with regards to immediate performance, we know just something like carbon dioxide will reduce your productivity at a thousand parts per million. It will reduce your productivity by 30 percent. And that has been uh, we've seen that research recreated several times with very, very similar results from it. So something as simple as that. Some of the other types of air pollutions, so when we start talking about particulates, mold, um, if we talk about heavy metals, organic type of chemicals, they also can have a, an impact on your performance as well. So there's still lots of research coming out from this. And I said at the beginning that when we talk about air quality, we often think about respiratory diseases. But actually what we're now seeing is there is a huge business case around getting this right so that people do feel comfortable in the environment and they feel they can perform at their best through it. Um, so certainly more research is needed about that relationship between performance and the long-term deterioration through ongoing exposure that's the bit that we know is one of the top health hazards. We know it, we can see it. We have to demonstrate again those relationships between it, more research is needed, um, but we definitely recognize about what you're breathing in is impacting hugely. And I talked about the impact on just, if you just look at the NHS bill on asthma and, and us having some of the highest asthma rates in the world, we need to start looking upstream to prevent this. And, um, and and these are some of the, the much bigger conversations that need to happen, really. And this is what I was saying about community. It's very difficult for us as individual people to make a choice of this, unless we're doing something with our immediate environment to try and improve the air. So we do need to do a lot more around it. Thank you. Love that. So what can we do practically right now as HR professionals, health and safety professionals, environment and sustainability profession, what can we do right now to support in particular our home workers? First thing is start the conversation about how they feel about their environment, include it in your DSC assessments as an example, you've got a channel already to speak. If you're doing wellbeing assessments, include it in there, so start talking to people, open the dialogue up. Actually some simple things that people can do at home as well of not having scented candles, not having sort of pollution sources in their home, opening the window, getting some fresh air in. They are simple things that people can do as starting points and I, and I think that will then lead on to having a much more engaged conversation but start talking about it, start assessing it, start getting people to feed into it. Julie, thank you ever so much. That was really insightful. I know I speak on behalf of everyone here. What a tremendous, tremendous 45 minutes. Uh, so thank you, Julie. 